Okay, I will talk into the microphone. Oh. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mary here this morning as we worship. We're going to continue our series this morning. We're in the series called Major Lessons from the Minor Prophets, and we're going to look at Abaka today. Um, he's kind of unique in himself as well. Uh, just drawing your attention to a few announcements. This afternoon, 5 o'clock, we're going to have the uh, prayer. We're going to be praying for the Brit City Schools. They begin school tomorrow. And so... Um, our church is going to be in charge of, I'll, I'll be leading the school at the, the group that will meet at um, Brick City Intermediate School. That's behind the elementary. But you can go to any of those schools. You, they're at, at, if you have a kid or you know someone in one of those schools, actually go to that school and, and you can pray there. 
Um, that'll be this afternoon, five o'clock there in Bridge City. So come and join that. We will be social distancing and a mask are required. So um, come on out there um, and help us with that. Um, this one's night again, will be online. Um, so come and tune in that. Ben's Breakfast is coming up this Saturday, eight o'clock here at the church building. A um, couple things have been postponed, of course, yesterday, but the URCL was postponed. Um, and we haven't set a date for that yet. And also the ladies' cleaning day, their service project this month was scheduled for the 8th. We have postponed that as well, but no date on that yet either. So those are coming up, so I'll make note of that. Again, look at your bulletin. Um, there's other dates coming up as well. I remember all of those. Uh, any other announcements here this morning? Anything I'm forgetting? All right. How about any anniversaries this week? No? How about birthdays? I didn't get a chance to look at the calendar. Any online? All right. Then if you don't mind, let's stand and um, let's, sing. let's, let's um, read together our call to worship this morning. It's found in Psalm chapter 88, verses 1 and 2. Now let's read together. It says, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Let's begin this prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity you give us today to be in this place and, and together with us online here today. Father, we're just so thankful that we can gather to worship you. And no matter where we're at, no, where, no matter where we're sitting or standing or where we're at, that we praise you and honor you today because your name is so worthy of our praise. Father, just ask your blessings upon this service for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing with me as we begin.
ready to move into our prayer time this morning. Just going to mention a few. Uh, we did definitely want to remember those um, deaths, the um, member of the Delone family, member of Glenda's um, um, family, the Fitzpatricks um, as well. Um, also, um, Marie told me this morning, Gene, or that's Dwight's brother, uh, his wife passed away from COVID and he's not doing very well. So we remember him in our prayers. Dwight's not feeling very well this morning. Linda either is not feeling well this morning either, so remember those. Um, Leroy told me uh, Tisha's mom, she went in for a sh sh operation on her shoulder. She tried to get out of bed and she fell and hit her head. She, now she's bleeding in her head, so they moved her to the Woodlands and we need to pray for her as well as you know, waiting for a neurologist. So, any other prayer requests here this morning? Yes, Glenda? Mandy has asked for prayer for her mother. Okay. Mandy Russell, pray for her mom. Yes. Daddy started his chemo pills Wednesday. Okay. So four days of it. So far, nothing's going on. Okay. Mom was having her report put in Friday, and she has two tests on Thursday. Okay. Her heart and then her body scan. Okay. So that's remember that's RC and Mary Russell. Um, uh, RC has begun his treatments. Mary's having some uh, report put in, and then she's going to some more tests. Well, actually, the tests are Thursday. And tests. Thursday and Friday, okay. Any others? All right. Let's sing together. Um, great is thy faithfulness, and then we'll pray together.
Most gracious Heavenly Father, you are magnificent and great God. So many in our lives, Father, we don't realize how big you really are and how majestic and how powerful you are. Father, we just come for you this morning and know that you are God and that we are not. That, Father, that we need you and we depend upon you. And we come before you here today and we are just praising you how faithful you are, how good you are. Father, we just ask you here today uh, that we just bring these petitions to you. And uh, we humbly bring them to you. Uh, Father, we ask you to be with uh, Mandy and her mom, her mom here this morning. We ask you to be with Mary and R.C. Um, as they are in these treatments and they're fighting cancer. And Father, we just ask you to place your healing hand upon their bodies and uh, bring them to healing. Father, we ask you to especially this morning to be with Tisha's mom and um, as she goes through this, this this ordeal right here and trying to figure out exactly what to do and know what to do. And Father, just be with the doctors and those standing to her needs. And Father, we just ask you to place your healing hand upon her as well this morning. Father, we um, we're just um, ask you to Jean um, um, for this morning as he lost his wife to COVID. And Father, would you help bring him comfort and um, um, bring him uh, just be with him and um, lift him up and Father, help us. Um, Help his family to just to, to, to surround him and help him. Father, I should be with both um, Dwight and Linda here this morning. They're not feeling well, and Father, we just ask you to just bring their body healing and, and so they feel better and um, they will recover. Father, there's so many more that are on our prayer list here this morning that um, we haven't listed one by one, but you know each of those needs. And Father, we just ask your intercession on each of their behalves here today. Father, I should be with our mission spotlight of the day. Um, that is um, Lifeline, Navajo Trails, and Father, continue to bless her and lead her. That Father, that uh, they should use the funds they're sent to her um, to uh, just to um, just glorify you in uh, uh, in a way that um, would draw others to you. Father, we're so thankful today to be in this place, and as we continue to worship here today, that you to be with us. But all these things in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. As we get ready to come around the Lord's table here this morning. I just want to focus in, focus this in here this morning on a thought. Uh, on February the 10th, 1982, there was a cargo ship, the SS Marine Electric. Uh, she left Norfolk, Virginia for Somerset, Massachusetts with over 24,000 tons of coal. The weather began to deteriorate in winds in excess of 60 knots and uh, created 40-foot seas that began to crash over the hull and onto the deck. The captain soon realized that the ship was going to sink. So he put out a distress call. By the time the Coast Guard helicopter reached the scene, the ship had already sunk and 34 crewmen were in the water. Time and time again, the helicopter lowered the rescue basket to the men below and they were so numb from hypothermia, they were unable to grab the basket. Of the 34 men that were in the water, only three were rescued that day. In the aftermath of that tragedy, Congress mandated that the Coast Guard establish a rescue swimmer program to create highly trained swimmers who could be lowered into the water and assist those who were incapacitated or could not save themselves. The program, Coast Guard Alaska, uh, is on the Weather Channel, and it, 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 that's what this show's about, about those rescue swimmers and, and how they go about saving people. And I couldn't help but think of the parallels between us and those in the sea waiting to be rescued. Like those out um, uh, overboard who can't do anything to save themselves, we are spiritually hypothermic and would surely all perish if it wasn't for a merciful father who commissioned a rescue swimmer to come down and to save us. This is revealed for us in John chapter 6, verse 38 and 39. Listen to how Jesus describes the mission that he was sent on. He says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of, the, of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Let's think about these things as we sing our, our, our song for um, communion here this morning, and then we'll pray and take communion together. Mm -hmm.
your communion cups are in the back if you haven't gotten one yet. Um, we're going to take it together. Let's, let's pray. Let's go to Heavenly Father. It's truly a great thing to think about here today. I think how much your amazing love really is. And that you sent a rescue swimmer for us, and that is Jesus. And we gather around this table here tonight, this morning, to gather around this table to remember that great sacrifice that Jesus laid down for us. And Father, so we ask you now to bless this bread, which represents Jesus' body. Ask you to bless it and help us to remember um, what was done to it so that our sins might be forgiven. Father, we ask you to bless this cup, which represents Jesus' blood. And help us never forget the blood that was shed for us so that we might have life. And Father, as we partake together here today, that you would just, you would just be with us, you would guide us, and help us to remember um, who we serve. For all these things, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's take the bread together. We also gather each week to worship uh, with our tithes and offering. And, uh, we're not passing offering plates here, here again today, but in the back um, and up at the front, there's offering plates. So if you brought your tithes and offerings here today, you can just bring those in and drop those in those. Um, again, for those that are not with us th today, you can still give online. Um, you also can do it through your bank. Um, you can bring it by here at the church during the week, or you can mail it here as well. So um, let's just take some time here to thank God for our tithes and offerings today. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity you give us to, uh, um, to make a living and, and, and provide you, that you provide for us and you provide for us with the income that we have. And Father, we just, um, just ask today as we bring back our tithes and our offerings that you would, um, would take those and you would bless those and that they may be used for the building of your kingdom, of winning others to you, and um, Father, just to carry out the work that you have given us here. And Father, we just ask you to today to bless those who are given and those who are not able to give this day, um, that everything would um, be used for your kingdom. For all these things, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the days of the Revolutionary War, there lived a preacher by the name of Peter Miller who enjoyed a, a friendship with General Washington. But there also dwelt in that town one guy named Michael Whitman. He was an evil-minded man who did all in his power to abuse and to oppose that preacher. One day Michael Whitman was involved in treason and was arrested and he was sentenced to death. The old preacher started out on foot and he walked the whole 70 miles to Philadelphia to plead for the man's life. He was admitted into Washington's presence, and at once he begged for the life of this traitor. Washington said, no, Peter, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. The preacher said, he's not my friend. He is my bitterest enemy that I have. Washington cried, what? So you walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a whole different light. And he says, I will grant you that part. And he did. And Peter Miller took, on, took Michael Whitman from the very shadows of death back to his own home, no longer as an enemy, but as a friend. See, that defines mercy. A contemporary of Jeremiah was this guy we're going to look at today in our series we're calling the Major Lessons from the Minor Prophets. And there's this guy named Habakkuk. And he was a prophet during the faithful days of Judah. Nineveh has been destroyed, and Babylon is the, is the nation that is, is ascending as a dominating power in the world. Josiah now is Judah's last good king, and he, he, he's already died, and, and he's left with his very weak, wicked son named Jehoiakim. 
Uh, only two or three decades, 20 to 30 years, is all that's left in Jews' existence as a nation remained when Habakkuk began to write. And as we open up the book of Habakkuk, we're going to see something very strange. The first two chapters is this conversation Habakkuk has with God. And it is talking about, where are you? Why, why aren't you punishing? And then God says, I am going to punish. I, I'm bringing this nation to Babylon. And then next thing he goes, Habakkuk is going, Babylon? That is such an evil, vile people. Why would you choose to use them to carry out your justice? And God says, I got this. I got this. So Habakkuk is one of the prophets used by God to, to use the God to pronounce the doom of three outstanding enemies of the people. Remember, we already said Obadiah, and he talk, talked about the fate of what country? Anybody remember? Edom? Remember Edom? Last week we talked about Nahum, and he talked about the fate of who? Assyria. Right? Okay? And so today, so remember, Obadiah talked about Edom, Nahum about Assyria, and God showed Habakkuk that Babylon, Babylon, even though God is using Babylon to punish his people, that he, that Habakkuk, that, that Babylon was also digging their own grave as well. And God was going to take care of Babylon. You don't worry, Habakkuk, about what I'm going to do. I will take care of them. So hence, the focus of Habakkuk's problem and prophecy is Babylon itself. And so all the prophets were conscientious of divine interpretation. And um, their work demonstrates it, yet it does leave room for their individuality. And so, but... It at least ample, ample room for them to be able to do that. And so Habakkuk is unique in the, this respect. Unlike the other prophets, he does not address his own countrymen or a foreign people. His words are for God and God alone. Autobiographical in flavor, this prophecy is primarily concerned with solving a problem. His inability to understand God's government of the nations vet, vets his own sensitive soul. Obviously familiar with the work of Amos and Moses, Habakkuk was bewildered by a third book that was constantly before his eyes, and that is the book of life. A God is a great God and greatly to be praised. A finite mind could no more comprehend what was going on around them. I mean, in, in his finite mind, he cannot comprehend what God is doing. No more than we can comprehend how you could put an entire ocean into a little bitty bucket. All eternity will be spent learning more and more how great and how good and how glorious that God really is. A note authority assures us that the Jews fancy um, concerning the cloud that, that con, uh, conducted Israel through the wilderness, that it did not only show them the way, but it also leveled it. And it did not only lead them in the way which they must go, but also fit the way for them to go upon it. And that has cleared all the mountains and smoothed all the rocks and it cleared all the bushes and removed all the pitfalls. See, our gracious God not only leads us in the way of mercy, but he prepares our path before us, providing all of our rocks even before they occur. So this morning, I want us to see this. One who knows to look discovers mercy. And there are three places that we can see here in the third chapter of Habakkuk, where we're to look for mercy. The first one, if you want to put this in your outline, mercy in appeal. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. And of course, that's in that, that last part of that, probably a, um, according to Shuganov, is a probably musical term. And then, it, then it continues saying, Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, what does it say? Remember mercy. During shaky times, mercy can be found in prayer. The words, O oh Lord, refers to Jehovah, the self-existent one. He is not the phony idol that can do nothing. I love what Isaiah talks about. How can you go out and take, cut, chop down a, a tree and one end you carve out a God and the other end you burn the wood in a fire? Those idols are nothing compared to God. God can do something. 
Habakkuk heard the speech of the Lord. He heard, understood, and believed what God was saying. Then Habakkuk was afraid. He says, in wrath, what does he say? Remember mercy. There are two parts to this prayer. The wrath of God would disseminate the sinful nation of Judah. The nation would be injured to the point of death, but the prayer is for revival. He says, in the middle of your wrath, Lord, that is in the middle of the years of destruction, Habakkuk is saying, remember mercy. See, there is mercy in petitioning God for revival. You need the mercy of God to recover, restructure, resume, go forward, to grow. Our stability is connected to God's mercy. Our progress is an act of God's mercy, relief from the consequences. And we need to thank God for mercy. He says, O oh Lord, receive your work in the midst, in the mix of the years. The prayer is my prayer too. And that is, we have revival. Revival of the Lord's work is in such a great need today. We need a sense of the Lord reviving his work and through us. Help us, O oh God. Help us to remember that it is God's work, his work. For it is to be revived, we must relinquish any hold of our own or any claim that we have. Ian Bounds says this. Men are never near heaven, near God, never more godlike, Never in deeper and truer partnership with God than when they are praying. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11 says this. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. During the last days between the war between the states, a Union soldier was arrested on charges of desertion. <coughs> Unable to provide to prove his innocence, he was condemned and sentenced to die a deserter's death. His appeal found his way to the desk of Abraham Lincoln. The president felt mercy for the soldier, and he signed a pardon. The soldier returned to service, fought the entirety of the war, and he was killed in the last battle. Found within his breast pocket was a signed letter from the president. Close to his heart of the soldier were the leader's words of pardon. He found his courage in the grace that the president gave him. I wonder how many thousands more have found courage in the blazoned cross of our King, of our God. The second thing I want us to see today about mercy is mercy and authority. Let's, let's continue to read there in the third chapter. Starting at verse 3, it says, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He is rays flashing from his hand, and they're in the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. During dark moments, mercy can be found in the power of God. See, the Lord is awesome, and he takes away the breath of one who really examines him. His glory covered the heavens. Wow, what a picture. All expansive as the heavens are, God's glory can be seen across it all. It is greater than it all. So how little we understand the true greatness of God. I think God allowed us to, to create the Hubble telescope. Because once we used that telescope, we started to see things we never could see before. And then we realized how big how awesome this universe in which God has placed us in. And I think God created this universe so for us to understand how big our God is. And we're not the biggest thing in the universe. Our sun is not the biggest thing in our universe. God made it all. God made all of us from his very hands. And we need to understand how great our God really is. We sung about that today, how great our God is. And God has brightness. Is like the light, but not the same. The merciful God is powerful and bright. He is dangerous if he wants to and needs to be. The brightness suggests God and majesty. And the answer to Habakkuk was, God will take care of Babylon. How can his power be hidden? See, God's glory was hidden on Mount Paran. The, the Lord came from, from there according to Habakkuk. 
And this is where the Israelites wandered in the, the, the last um, three days, march from Sinai, and they, they wandered and wandered and wandered. From Kadesh in the wilderness, spies were sent to spy the land. There, here, long afterwards, David found refuge from Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. In each of those cases, majesty, the majesty of God, was hidden. How can it be hidden unless God wills that it to be concealed? God's power is removed from notice by his desire to have it unnoticed or by man's distraction with the other things in their life. Much more, uh, much about God's power and majesty can be hidden by attention to focus on somewhere else. Think about this. A light of the sun can be blocked out, blocked out if you hold a coin. You hold a coin close enough to your face, you can actually block out the sun. In a similar way, focusing our attention intensely on things like money, false gods, control of my life, we can allow those things to cloud our vision or be so close in our vision that we it prevents us from noticing the power of our God. When the infidel Robert G. Ingersoll was delivering his lectures against Christ and the Bible, his oratorial ability usually assured that he would. He was such a good speaker, he would draw a big, big crowds. One night after an inflammatory speech in which he severely attacked a man's faith in a, in a God, in, in God himself, he dramatically um, took out his watch and he said this, I'll give God a chance to prove to me that he really exists and that he is almighty. I challenge him to strike me dead within five minutes. Then there was a silence. The people became uneasy. Some left the hall. Unable to take the nervous strain of the occasion, one woman fainted. And at the end of the allotted time, the atheist exclaimed derisively this, See, there is no God. I am still very much alive. After a lecture, a young fellow said to a Christian lady, Well, Ingersoll certainly proved something tonight. Her reply is very memorable, and this is what she said. Yes, he did, she said. He demonstrated that even the most defiant sinner cannot exhaust the patience of the Lord in just five minutes. And another man added, he said, as I was coming downtown today, a belligerent little fellow came running out of the alley, daring me to hit him. Do you suppose I actually struck him? Just because he challenged me to do so. In the same way, our Lord will not strike everyone dead who defies him. We should be thankful that in this age he is still operating in grace and he desires to show his love rather than his wrath. See, it's not obligatory for a strong man to destroy an ant, even when the insect deserves it. The third thing I want us to see, the last thing I want us to see today is this, mercy and assessment. Let's finish reading that. Let's read the 6 through 13. He says, he stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan, Cushan, Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare. The, road, the rods of chastisement was sworn. You cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon start, stood in their places. They went away at the, the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your glimmering spear. In indignation, you marched through the earth. In anger, you tempted the nations. Lord, for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed, you struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from the thigh to neck. So in points of uncertainty, mercy can be found in God's measurement. See, God distinguishes between his people and the lost. God outlasts all the prevailing earthly landmarks. He measures 
because he is the standard and the judge. He makes mountains tremble, the sun and the moon halt, and for the for the salvation of his people. To deliver his people, he strikes the head from the from the house of the wicked as he measures matters. His comparison between his people and anything else places a very high value on his people. And when God stares, he is capable of revealing all. Back at verse three, verse six, three six, there it says he stood, and what did he do? He measured the earth. God assessed the earth. He looked it over as would an inspector, and he is standing, and uh, his standing cannot be ignored. His measurement cannot be ignored. Not one inch of all the earth, not one person in any corner escapes his infinite notice. And when he measures, he uses his standard. They are the ones that matter. He accesses all things as they are. And it does not matter if man says what is wrong is, is, is good. It doesn't matter if we say it is okay to abort babies when God says it's wrong to abort babies. It's, it, it, God, we can, we can say anything we want. We, we can make measurements. We can change measurements. And we think we're so smart. That we can go out and we can change things and say what is detestable to God is something that is good. And it doesn't really matter because the only measurement that really matters is that of God himself. It doesn't change. And he comes and he's going to judge. How much will he take? When will he judge us? When he measures, he uses his very own standards. Consider the eternal gaze of God. When he stares, his gaze penetrates to the innermost soul. Remember Peter was fishing? Him and the disciples were fishing. They caught nothing. Jesus comes along and he says, throw that net on the other side. You can imagine what Peter was thinking, right? I'm a fisherman. What are you? Carpenter? You know, what, what do you think? What do you think? And he throws that on the other side. And there are so many fish that he can't even, they can't get in. they threatening to sink the boat. And Peter looks at God and he says, leave me. Leave me. I'm a sinner. And that is the penetration. That is the view of God. Because when God looks at us, when God looks into us, he sees us. He stares at us. He penetrates the innermost part of our soul. Now think of how Peter felt when those eyes met his. Can you imagine what it was like when Jesus was on the cross and he looked down and he saw Peter? What Peter must have felt because he betrayed God, betrayed his Lord. No wonder the nations were startled at the stare of God. No wonder the mountains are scattered and the perpetual hills above. As permanent as they seem, mountains and hills, and certainly nations, powerful though they might be, are all temporary, and they last only as long as God wills them it to be. Earthly fixtures shift and change. But God's ways are everlasting. The powerful forces of nature yield to the will of their maker. God attacks his enemies. See, this past tense description of the Lord marching through the nations in the evening nation and the anger sounds prophetic. Is this a future reference viewed with a prophetic certainty as so as to report it as past? When the Lord moves, there is certainty whether whether his will has occurred yet or not. Marching is a deliberate act. Whether it, it has happened or not, it is guaranteed to happen. It refers moving intensely and forcefully through an area. The traveling of the nation is an act of anger. What causes anger? Perhaps the Gentile nations attacking God's people. Verse 13 seems to verify this. The reason for God's movement in verse 12 is the need to deliver his people in verse 13. We went, we went because his people needed salvation. The tones in the section of the, this poetic prayer seem very prophetic. These appear to be a shift in attention. The reference to salvation with your anointed, hence to the Savior, and marks this as a messianic passage, striking the head from the house of the wicked. Most likely refers to the feet of Satan. This language is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God used the enemy's own devices to defeat him. And when the enemy attacked God's beloved, he responded and attacked the enemy. This verse could report the view of the Messiah at the, 
at the time of attack on the cross. The distance God goes and the obstacles he encounters for his people are all but meaningless to him except for his care for us, though they should increase our appreciation. The body trembles at the recognition of God's wrath, even on the enemy. The voice of God can make the body tremble when it really heard and understood. And I have seen lips quiver at the confrontation by opposition that produces respect from the oppressor. How did rottenness enter the bones of Habakkuk? Inwardly he trembled. He was preparing ahead of time for the tough time that is coming. In this preparation, he drew close to God and he prayed for mercy in verse 4. He also allowed himself to dwell on the magnitude of what was going to occur. By doing this, he was making it more likely that he could view the proceedings calmly when they actually occurred. He could be around when they happened or could be in God's presence. Either way, he could be calm. I need this kind of peace developed from prayers for mercy. There are tough Sundays in ministry of any kind. These tough days are tough on us. And I need God's mercy to revive me, revive us in the middle of those times. See, this is unavailable. This is available to me in prayer and peaceful reliance on His very promises. He gives mercy in the middle of trials. Troubles come. I need to listen and get my trembling out of the way ahead of time so that I can rest in the day of trouble. I recently read a story about a woman who said that as a girl, she was very poor. She said, I grew up um, in a cold water flat, but I married a man who had money. And he, he took me up to a place where I had flowers and I had gardens and I had grass. It was wonderful. And we had children. And then suddenly, I became physically sick. I went to the hospital and the doctors ran all sorts of tests. One night, the doctor came into my room and with a long look on his face, he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, your liver has stopped working. I said, doctor, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, are you telling me that I'm dying? And he said, uh, I can't tell you any more than that. Your liver has stopped working. We've done everything we can to start it. And then he walked out. She said, I knew I was dying. I was dying. I was weak. I had to feel my way along the corridor down to the chapel of the hospital. He, she said, I wanted to tell God off, and I wanted to tell God, you're a shyster. You have been passing yourself off as this loving God for 2,000 years, but every time anyone begins to get happy, and you pull the rug right from underneath them. And I wanted to see God face to face so I could tell God this. And just as I got into the center aisle of the chapel, I tripped, I swooned, I fainted, and I looked up. And there, stenciled along the step into the sanctuary, the, where the altar is, I saw these words. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. She said, I knew God spoke to me that night. I know he did. She didn't say how God communicated with her, but what God said was this. You know what this is all about? It's about the moment of surrender. It's about bringing you to that moment when you surrender everything, everything to me. These doctors, they can do the best they can, but they can only treat I'm the only one who can cure you. And she said, there with my head down on my folded arms in the center of the chapel, repeating, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I surrender to God. I found my way back into to my hospital bed, weak as I was. The next morning after the doctor ran the blood tests and the urine analysis and so forth, he said, your liver started working again. We don't know why. We don't know why it stopped, and we definitely don't know why it started up again. 
And I said in my heart, but I know. Oh, but I know. God has brought me to the brink of disaster just to get me to turn my life over to him. Mercy in the middle of misery. This morning we're going to sing an imitation song. And it's really, it really all boils down to this. Have you surrendered to God? This young lady, she gave her life to God at one time. But guess what? She never fully surrendered. What are you holding back in your life today? What part of your life are you holding back from God? God wants every part of it, all of it. Give it all to Him. We're going to sing a song of decision this morning. And maybe today is the day that you give your life to Him completely. Maybe you never have. Maybe today is to surrender to God, make Him Lord of your life, accept Him as your Savior. Go down the water of the grave baptism and have your sins washed away. But for most of us this morning, we're probably just dealing with this idea of surrender. How we given it all, everything to Him. And maybe that's exactly what Jesus is waiting for today. He's waiting for us to surrender everything. Will you sing with me? You have a decision to make this day. Come as we sing. I'll be up here at the front. If you have a decision to make, come as we sing. Please stand with me. schools and cities, so come and be a part of that and we tonight tune in for our Bible study. Uh, let's close with prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, 
Uh, it's so great to be able to trust you. And um, it's, that's what it's about. Surrendering our lives to you and trusting you that you're the one in charge, not us. And uh, Father, as we leave here, that we just don't keep these words to ourselves today, but Father, we share those with the ones we come in contact with and just give us the courage to share what you mean to us so that others can know what we know. And Father, as we leave here, we ask you to be with us when we meet again. Pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you, sweet girl. See you. I love you.